Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is from Joshua chapter 3. The Reverend Dr. John Sias is preaching. The broadcast of chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. Reading from the baptism of our Lord from Joshua the third chapter. Then Joshua arose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. O Lord, have mercy upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Though it may appear so from too comfortable a distance, the Old Testament is not simply deep background, a collection of superfluous prequels to the only movie worth watching or a treasury, perhaps, of old catchphrases we throw around to mean entirely new and dissimilar things, taking, for instance, the promised land to mean America, and to write nice snippets on our liberty bells. No, these things in Joshua 3 happened as types of us, written down for our understanding, upon whom the end of the ages, namely Jesus the Christ, has come. Now today we could isolate these few verses picked out from Joshua 3, focus on the elementary things. The miraculous revelation, for instance, of divine power and parting another body of water, the Jordan and its fearsome flood, ending the promised land journey as it began with the removal of insurmountable obstacles indubitably by the hand of God. Salvation being God's doing from beginning to end. Or we might focus on the mercy seat covering the tablets of the law. The only God enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant, concretely as he would be in the man God was to become, reconciled to his people by the blood of sacrifice, that overflowing flood stopping up afar off when once touched by even the feet made beautiful by the carrying of this gospel and the death of Jesus, even if only in figure and type, already carrying the day. Or we might focus on the fact that it is the priest's feet bearing that mercy seat, that atonement cover, that crucifixion and figure, their feet that part the waters, and not those of Joshua. Even as by this sign he is exalted as Moses was before the people, this portending that the greatness of every prophet is that he decreases for Jesus' increase, and also that had Joshua's war been able to give Sabbath, God would not speak of a Sabbath rest to come, but he would. That perhaps, too, the law was made known by Moses, but grace and truth and way and life would come in Jesus, 
whose Sabbath rest remains for God's people and to which we strive. Or, I suppose, most marvelous of all the elementary things, we might dwell on the fact that when the real and final act happens at the Jordan, the big one, that we ought to marvel that when Jesus steps down into the water to be baptized by John, we should marvel that the water itself doesn't resist as John the baptizer tried, that it does not part again and refuse to wet the feet of the Holy One passing on as if to conquer men. We should marvel that it instead suffers silently the divine will to wet him with our filth on his way to conquer not men but sin and death and thereby to fulfill all the righteousness of God. These are the basic things, I think, of this text. But I want us to move on a bit to think today on these people as types of us. For are we not baptized into this Jesus, baptized at this Jordan? Your and my baptism, I suppose, might be comfortably distant, might not even be remembered by us ourselves, but the baptism of Jesus certainly is distant to us. These events of the Old Testament more so, these comfortably distant events, all of them tend to be submerged and flooded over by so many supposedly nearer hopes and fears. But what reigns supreme here at the Jordan over what easily could have? If these Israelites are types of us from whose example we are to learn, if their following the ark through the flood is like our being baptized into Jesus who is baptized here, all that accumulation of other nonsense must be stripped away. And the doing and working, hoping and fearing of our here and now must be reconceived in the doing and working of God alone. These people of God here at the Jordan Crossing are, after all, in a more profound sense than we can imagine, although I think it's getting easier, strangers in a strange land. And that is not relieved by a miracle of God here, but that fact is made by the miracle of God. When the river opens and they walk through, they have no citizenship in the land to which they are going except that bespoke by God. No possession but a few old tombs, no homes but the old tents they bear, no leek or cucumber or fish or flesh pot but the manna, and that is coming to an end not a foot's breadth of quarter in the land, except in that ill-reputed house of Rahab of Jericho, most unexpected, and that in a city now buttoned up against their approach. Not one king of the lot wants to offer them freedom to do what they are there to do, nor can they seek or barter for it. And their very crossing of that river cements a hasty, allergic alliance of the powers of Canaan that be to repel their invasion, word of God for it or no. Yet, uh, yes, the divine miracle of God's opening, that river, gets them into the promised land. That's true. But that land is not itself the rest that remains to them and us. And when the divine miracle of God closes that river behind them, when the feet of those bearing the gospel have made it to the other side, the land in which they're put with it is a decidedly uncomfortable place to be. For there they sit in the very shadow of fearsome and fearful Jericho. They have the word of God which sets them free to be something heretofore unimagined by men. But the aroma of life is to those unacquainted the citizens of Canaan, the stench of death instead. And how can men who cannot imagine what these are given to be possibly invite them to really live out something unimaginable in their midst? To know and hear what we believe and why we are here, to perceive why it is that people like us, why it is better for people like us who are always looking for another country, a heavenly one, nevertheless to remain in this land, that it is not for our business but for the sake of his great name, when it is perceived what work we have to do and why we cannot just keep it all to ourselves, 
what the Word of God has to say to all, not just to those who want to listen. This has, this very day, the walled cities of our very own land shut up against us. God is at the Jordan doing his thing, and how can everything so stubbornly founded on something else not tremble, sensing that at his coming all else must finally fall? We're kind of in their boat there in the shadow of this walled-up town. But the lesson of this day, these people being types of us, is that at all this, we need not be the least concerned. We are not the victims here, but the victors. And we have no cause to be depressed or fearful, for when God hems us in, as he did his people here at the new side of the Jordan, and indeed, who else can hem us in? When God does it, it is for good. For our Jesus has crossed the Jordan, not as dry for worldly warfare, but wet. The Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world away and lives. The Sabbath rest himself of the people of God and the end of the ages. Seen, touched, heard, crucified, risen, ascended on high, and into him we are baptized. And if the types and figures so carried the day at the Jordan and at Jericho, how will not today and forever all things meet their good end in him? It is, dear Christian friends, with him and not alone that we stand in this land, perhaps as strangers and stranger every day. But so be it. Our weapons are not of this world, nor can this world overcome what we have. We see the people who are types of us here make this grand entrance in the shadow of Jericho, the great city walled up against them with all the land, knowing and trembling that the word of God gives all into his hand. God brings them in, hems them in on the plains of Jericho. In the sight of nations perplexed to enmity, what do they do? As we read a little further, they gather there on the plains of Jericho and a new generation is circumcised and they celebrate the Passover in a new land. That comes first, rather remarkably. And what can the heathen do, even against these shadows of the things that we now possess and live out in him? What can they do but watch and wonder? Where these at the Jordan and the shadow of the towers and javelins of Jericho appear, humanly speaking, to be least free, surrounded by enemies, hemmed in by God, to be able to do only the very thing that he has commanded. As they are there, made by it all ever more strange in a strange land, the truth is they are the most profoundly free to do something unimaginable to men, to be something unimaginable to men people of God, the people of God. So remember this today. So are we. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.